This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the China History Podcast. Laszlo Montgomery here with you again, as usual. Last time we convened, I gave an overview of the origin of the I Ching and how it caught on quite quickly and fast became one of the many core elements of early Chinese culture. I mentioned last time among the activities that Confucius indulged himself in in his last years was the study of this very same Book of Changes. As tradition tells it, Confucius was a 70-year-old man before he felt he was old enough, mature enough, and wise enough to take on the study of the I Ching, and he famously lamented in his old age in the Lunyu, the Analects of Confucius. The great sage said, quote, If a hundred years were added to my life, I would give fifty to the study of the I Ching, and might then escape falling into great errors. End quote. Confucius believed this work contained the moral wisdom of the ancients, and for this reason he truly revered it. But you had to put on your miner's helmet and go deep down to seek out its hidden wisdom. In adding these ten wings or commentaries to the I Ching, Confucius injected a bit of yin and yang and philosophy into the mix and then combined it with the I Ching's cosmology that espoused the fundamental unity of heaven, earth, and humanity. Tian di ren. And because now humans were inserted into the cosmological mix, the fundamental unity of Tian di ren, heaven, earth, and humanity, became central to everything. In the all-important milestone year of 136 BCE, during the Western Han Dynasty, the 64 hexagrams, the judgments, line statements, and the Ten Wings, or Confucian commentaries, became the imperially sanctioned official standard text of the I Ching. So this is where the Zhou Yi, the changes of Zhou, thought to have been finalized back in 800 BCE, itself changes and becomes known as the Book of Changes, the I Ching. I know previous to this, I've been calling it the I Ching, but actually, it's only here, in the Han, during the early years of Emperor Wu, where it is named for the first time as the I Ching. And this work was officially included into what was grouped together as the five classics, the Wu Jing. Throughout this series, we'll be mentioning these five classics, these canons of Chinese ancient philosophy. And these five classic works are, besides the Book of Changes, the Classic of Poetry, Book of Documents, Book of Rites, and the Spring and Autumn Annals. And henceforth, the I Ching, if you'll indulge me, became a kind of operating system. And this OS was orbited by a multitude of plug-and-play apps that incorporated numerology, astronomy, the seasons, the five elements, the ten celestial stems, and the twelve earthly branches, diagrams and drawings, and aspects of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism that collectively, ladies and gentlemen, offered limitless interpretive possibilities within the 64 hexagrams of the Book of Changes. And this allowed for an explanation of just about anything and everything that could happen in the world, including with your very own self. In 1973 came the Ma Wang Dui discovery, where a total intact Han Dynasty tomb was unearthed near Changsha in Hunan that had been sealed shut in the 2nd century BCE. Imagine the delight to these archaeologists when they discovered inside that tomb perfectly preserved copies of the Tao Te Ching and the I Ching, as well as never seen before additional commentaries on the I Ching that had not seen the light of day for 21 centuries. So after all these years, something that had, since the time of Han Wu Di at least, been considered a complete and finished document, 
Well, they learned from these additional texts in 1973 that the complete story had still not been told. In addition to that, this Ma Wang Tui copy of the I Ching ordered the text in a completely different way than what had been known before, the way that had been credited to the Zhou Dynasty King Wen, and the way the Ten Wings or commentaries were ordered, were not the same as the version long accepted as the final one. So in the world of the I Ching, the 1973 Ma Wang Tui discovery was a pretty big deal. That's how it is in China. They're still digging things up that turns on its head events that we have always accepted as the official history. So we can see how, prior to the introduction of the Ten Wings, the Yi Jing's role had sort of been limited to that of a high-octane divination manual. With these ethical commentaries injected into the core document, philosophers during the Han period began to view the I Ching as not only a guide to divination, but also as a work that combined moral philosophy with cosmology and numerical speculation. Also, it was by the Han dynasty that the I Ching had had time to absorb many Taoist and Buddhist ideas, and those too also began brazing in the pot. The Ten Wings and all the commentaries that followed, there were so many written over the centuries. They sought to figure this Tian Di Ren interrelationship out, heaven, earth, person, or humanity. Because of the built-in flexibility of the I Ching, the commentaries varied greatly as far as what the philosophers thought. Scholars would spend hours, days, and even longer just contemplating the mysteries, what-ifs, and maybes of just one single hexagram. In fact, you can be certain that all 4,000-plus characters contained in the I Ching over the past 3,000 years have been intensely scrutinized down to the subatomic level. Zuo Chiu Ming's Commentaries on the Chun Chiu, the Spring and Autumn Annals, is the earliest work that really gave later scholars a better comprehension of the workings of the I Ching. This work by Zuo Chiu Ming was called the Zuo Zhuan. So let's look at these wings. The first two wings are called the Commentary on the Images. There's also the Commentary on the Judgments. The fifth and sixth wings are the most crucial. They are called the Great Commentary, or Da Chuan. It uses Confucianism to explain the metaphysics and moral ethics of the I Ching. It attempted to take humankind and all the natural forces in the world and tried to tie everything together into one neat little package. Tian Di Ren, Heaven, Earth, Person. How everything is all interrelated. The Great Commentary is the most referred to of the Ten Wings. The other wings all deal with different aspects of the I Ching, including how to read the hexagrams. It explains the trigrams this way, quote, Of old, when Fu Xi ruled the world, he gazed upwards and observed images in the heavens. He gazed about him and observed patterns upon the earth. He observed markings on birds and beasts, how they were adapted to different regions, Close at hand, he drew inspiration from within his own person. Further afield, he drew inspiration from the outside world. Thus, he created the eight trigrams. He made connections with the power of the spirit light. He distinguished the myriad of things according to their essential nature. End quote. Now, the whole idea of yin and yang, or supreme ultimate, or the tai chi symbol... This is all part and parcel of the I Ching. You all know the yin-yang symbol. Besides the South Korean flag, it's on a million pieces of art, objects, and tattoos. This symbol didn't arrive on the scene until the Song Dynasty, 960 to 1279. And we'll get to that as soon as we start discussing Neo-Confucianism and Zhou Dunyi and the proliferation of these charts and diagrams that became big hits in their day. Let's look at yin-yang for a second. Yin symbolizes the shady, secret, dark, lunar, mysterious, cold, hidden, passive, receptive, yielding, cool, soft, and of course, the feminine gender. Yang, on the other hand, is the opposite of everything yin, 
With yang, you have clear, bright, solar, hot, illuminated, evident, active, aggressive, controlling, hard, and, of course, the masculine gender. Many other forces are attributed to yin and yang, but the important thing to know is these are all opposites working together as one whole single system. Yin is earth. Yang is heaven. The whole world is viewed in the I Ching as a system of interacting opposites. These opposites do not fight each other. Instead, they complement each other and work in consort to bring about change. As I said, the I Ching focuses on the forces of change. Nothing is static. Things change over time. Our task on this earth is to adjust to the circumstances of life as they unfold before us. The I Ching exists just for this reason. By understanding the forces of yin and yang, these mutually dependent opposites, and the forces they have on our life, you can be better prepared to deal with whatever crossroads you come to. The Chinese, like other advanced civilizations, believe numbers provided the link between humans and how they were developing on this earth and with the great unknown, the supernatural, or the Tao, whatever you want to believe. With mathematics, there were ways to find hidden order and patterns amidst the randomness and disorder of life. Later on, when we get to the Song Dynasty, a lot of far-out theories are going to be made that are intensively numerology-based. It was believed back then, and I guess still today by some people, that spirits or hidden powers, when they spoke, used the language of numbers. And I'm sure you've all heard, when the day comes, when we make contact with aliens from outer space, most likely it will be the language of math that enables us to communicate. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust, or is it... A real POS. You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. I mentioned Richard Wilhelm already. He was a German Christian missionary and the person in the West we have most to thank for bringing us the I Ching. Wilhelm was a great champion of the I Ching. He was the one who was primarily responsible for taking the I Ching from the exclusive realm of Chinese and other East Asian cultures and bringing it to a very interested and appreciative Western audience that quickly embraced it. But who influenced Richard Wilhelm? Surely he wasn't the first Westerner to discover the divining powers and philosophy contained in the I Ching? Surely not. We all know Westerners were turning up in China all the time going back to the olden days. And one of those foreigners, a Jesuit of course, always the Jesuits when we talk about the earliest Western scholarship of Chinese culture, Father Joachim Bouvet, he was one of the six French Jesuits who came to China in 1687 on the orders of the Sun King, Louis XIV, to glean through whatever scientific data and intel they could and bring it back to France. Bouvet ended up being appointed as a tutor to the Kangxi Emperor. He became enamored of the I Ching from the start and dedicated himself to somehow, some way find that linkage between the wisdom contained in the Chinese classics and with the Holy Bible. He was the earliest of these Jesuits to go to great lengths to unlock the mystery of the I Ching. They kept up their work into the 18th century, and the result was the first Latin translation. The great Scottish sinologist James Legg produced the first English version of the I Ching, among many other translations of the classics. Father Joachim Bouvet died on October 9th in Beijing in 1730, and that's where he was buried. In his report sent back to Louis XIV, he said of the I Ching, quote, This work contains the principle of all sciences, and, put more precisely, it is a fully developed metaphysical system, end quote. It was these Jesuit fathers like Joachim Bouvet who got everything started. 
And going back to the very beginning with Matteo Ricci, if the Jesuits were going to get some traction with Catholicism in China, they had to first find common cultural ground to teach what their religion was all about. So what did they do? They went straight to the five classics and the four books and tried to pry open that door one Chinese character at a time. The scholarship and industry of these first China scholars to come from the West can never be emphasized enough. They may not have gotten everything right, but they had to dig the thankless foundation upon which all other Western scholarship of China could be built. Top of their lists for the Jesuits was the main mission, convert Chinese to Catholicism. So their focus was all on the philosophy and religion of China. And this is why Bouvet latched onto the I Ching in particular. Bouvet was a numbers man, so he was really able to appreciate some of these far-out numerology-based theories. There were other ancient documents that were pointed to that supported a lot of this speculation and mathematics. From that moment, beginning in the late 17th century, Western scholarship of the I Ching was continuous, and you could bet these scholars were always looking over the shoulder of their Chinese colleagues. They had a 2,000-year head start, so there was plenty of accumulated Chinese scholarship and wisdom to glean through. Then later on in the 19th century, Western scholars of China began to realize for the first time how central the I Ching was to so many other aspects of Chinese culture, not just cosmology and philosophy. So standing on all these shoulders, Richard Wilhelm, in 1923, began working on his own translation from the archaic classical Chinese of the I Ching into modern German. He was supervised by someone with the pedigree of Confucius himself, someone of the Kong family who, when the work was completed, gave it the Kong family seal of approval and coming from a descendant of Confucius, was almost as good as getting it from the man himself. And it was later on in 1950 that this work was translated and published in English for the first time. The Book of Changes in the first half of the 20th century was, I guess you could say, not for everybody. I'm guessing it was more of a novelty or, or a prop someone kept in their parlor or their library. Then came 1961, when another English edition was published, and to lend credibility and attention to this new book of changes, no less a person than Carl Jung himself, the father of analytical psychology and a colleague of Sigmund Freud, wrote the preface. C.G. Jung, even in his day with his work on synchronicity, was a pretty well-known and respected chap, so he's always mentioned in the same breath with Freud. His preface of this edition of the I Ching led to a lot of book sales. In the 1960s, there was a major surge in awareness about Jung's work. And with a celebrity of Carl Jung's stature associated with the I Ching, copies flew off the shelves in the West. And unless I'm mistaken, it's been on someone or other's bestseller list ever since, and in many languages. The 1967 edition of the I Ching, the third one, was one of the classics of the hippie culture of the 1960s. In East Asia, however, the Book of Changes wasn't some fad or inspiration for all kinds of reasonably priced talismans. It was taken much more seriously. When the early emissaries from Korea, Japan, and Vietnam began coming to China and the Han Dynasty, especially during the Silk Road glory years, they brought back everything to their respective countries that they could get their hands on, and they got it right away. They understood, as far as what the I Ching and these other Confucian works could do for them, where they came from. And that's how it migrated there. Not so much to the West, beyond Tibet. It was mostly these three places in particular that this ideology was embraced, along with the system and way of living. Vietnam isn't China, neither are Korea and Japan. So in bringing these particular aspects of Chinese culture into their worlds, well, they had to take the raw material from China 
and whittle around the edges and process it a little, adjust it here and there, and make it fit better with their own culture. This is true not only of the I Ching, but for Confucianism, Taoism, and Chinese Buddhism. How do people in their everyday lives use the I Ching? How do you determine the hexagram that was meant for your situation? There are a number of ways people engage the I Ching. The old-fashioned traditional way, like they did back in ancient times, was to use the stems or stalks of the yarrow plant, Achillea milfolium, to generate the six lines of your special hexagram. But around the Tang Dynasty, a new method was introduced that remains the most popular way today to generate a hexagram. This is the three coins method. Heads and tails. You toss three coins six times to get the hexagram. Each toss of the coins gives you a number. Heads are worth three and tails are worth two. Three heads, for example, equal three plus three plus three equal nine. And then there is a corresponding line that goes with these numbers, always straight or broken. Mathematically, using three coins that can only have two outcomes, each means you're either going to get a six or a nine or a seven or an eight. Six equals old yin changing. Eight is yin unchanging. Seven is yang yang, unchanging, and nine is yang changing. This method is a lot simpler than the euro stalks, and if you're going to try it out, I recommend this three coins method. Straight line is called a dark line or the yang line, and the broken line is the light line, also called the yin line. Light or dark, straight or broken, yin or yang one on top of the other, to build six rows. And you start at the bottom. There are no accidents in life or dumb luck. Anyone who at any time in their life felt things happen for a reason can't argue that when three coins fall tails, tails, heads, that straight line that is associated with that specific number was purely an accident. This process is called claromancy. This is where you cast lots, like rolling dice, casting euro stalks, or three coins. And the outcome is determined by some higher power, like the will of God. Anyone who has been to Wong Tai Sin Temple in Hong Kong, or any Taoist temple for that matter, has seen an example of this kind of practice. If you're shaking strips of bamboo out of a cup with a message on them, and one drops out of the cup... It didn't fall out on accident. Some unseen force caused it. It's really this simple, but like everything else with the I Ching, simple, but not so simple. Once you generate your special hexagram, one of 64, by tossing the coins, you consult the text of the I Ching, and it gives you a line-by-line analysis of the hexagram and reveals the situation, always from the bottom line to the top line. You read that, you get your answer or advice, whatever you want to call it. But once again, you have to be careful how you interpret it or who you have interpreted it for you. This isn't like a slip of paper out of a fortune cookie. It's slightly more complicated. Some of these I Ching masters in China are quite renowned and get paid tens of thousands of dollars to come in and do some of these jobs. Some of you might be shaking your head and thinking... What is all this to do with tapping into the unseen forces all around us? No one from Missouri is going to believe this. But this is the thing. Yeah, it's tossing three coins, and who cares? Could be dimes, nickels, quarters, euros, or Norwegian krona. As long as all three coins are the same, you got to believe and be in the right frame of mind. The way I see it, If it didn't work and was all a bunch of theoretical BS, how did it last 3,000 years like it did? There's a reason. Okay, let's put the bookmark in right here. Confucius, 
wished he had at least 50 years to study this great work, so I hope you didn't think I was going to be able to cut it all up and package it up for you in just two episodes. I encourage you all to go check it out for yourself and see if any of the almost 3,000 or so years of wisdom can enrich your life. You can't believe how many people swear by it. And not just in the Chinese-speaking world, either. You haven't heard the last of the I Ching. It's going to be popping up here and there, especially as we spotlight several Han and Song philosophers. In the next episode, we're going to take a bit of a detour and start looking at Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu and how Taoism caught on so quickly, becoming another of the great Chinese homegrown religions. So you might want to consider coming back next time. Until then, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from L.A., California. Do consider fitting me into your listening queue for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.